We mash them, we fry them, we boil them and we bake them. And we do a whole lot more to them. But did you know that this little blob of starch is actually responsible for some of the major changes in European history? Thanks to this little blob of starch, Europe became what we know it as today. Before we can dive into how the potato became from relatively unknown to the number one staple food in most European countries, we have to look a little bit into its history. I am, after all, a history teacher. Pre-European potatoes. The potato finds its origin in the western southern Americas, near the Andes region. I'm gonna slaughter this name, but the oldest recorded findings are near Anchon in central Peru. These are 2500 BC, which means that to this date, the oldest potato that we know is 4,500 years old. I don't think that potato would still look as appetizing as this potato right here, but those are the oldest recordings and findings that we have of potatoes. This humble potato would become one of the staple foods of a lot of civilization in the region, including and none other than that of the Inca Empire. But how do we know that potatoes were so important to the people in this region? Well, very simple. When something is important to you, you want to depict it, you want to show it, and you want to let people know, hey, this is something that we have. You know what we found? Clay works that are shaped like a potato that can hold Potatoes. If you make potato shaped clay to hold your potatoes, potatoes are quite important in your potato based society. So, this is how we know that in South America, the potatoes were quite important. They made art about it and they thought it had a cultural relevance to them, enough for it to depict it. But how did the potato get from South America to Europe? The potato travels overseas. How did this glorious globe of carbohydrates get over to us in Europe. There is some speculation and debate on that matter, but in general people agree that there were two main ports of entry. One of them being Spain and one of them being the British Isles. The first time these tubular tubers entered Europe was in Spain, somewhere between 1516 and 1570. The second time was at the British Isles, somewhere between 1588 and 1593. Uh, how do we know that the Spain one was first? Well, there is some recorded evidence uh, in the form of a receipt uh, from a trading vessel going from Las Palmas to Antwerp on which it says potatoes. So we know that somewhere around 1576, potatoes were from going from Spain towards what's nowadays Belgium. From here on out, the potato would make its way through Europe and its way up the food chain picky eaters. At first, Europeans refused to eat these starch-filled globe forms of happiness, considering food forced the natives, who undeniably had to do the hardest job and needed the best nutrition. This pattern also was visible in England, where there is writing that suggests that the potato was considered food for the working class, the people who had to do manual labor, and so again, the people who had to do the hardest job Potatoes were regularly taken aboard ships on long sea voyages because of their shelf life and their sheer calorie count. Through the rest of Europe we also see a trend of the potato being something for the working class. The people who didn't have a lot of money to spend but were actually doing a lot of hard work. It was also being used as fodder for animals. However, the traditional grains of Europe still reigned supreme. How did the shift happen from grains reigning supreme to the potato being the number one staple food. The potato was slowly turning into a symbol for the revolution. The shift. In the 17th century, Europe's agricultural system was a very traditional one. Of open fields and rotation of crops, which meant that the potato could only be farmed in small garden crops because the potato didn't fit well in the crop rotation system. Uh, together with the bounds said that the communal fields had to be farmed with Grains. These garden plots were mainly meant for private consumption, not large retail or sale. The potato also wasn't very well accepted, because the flowers of the potato are actually poisonous, and anything that grows underground was considered something not to be trusted. 
Why do we trust carrots? Somebody tell me. In the end of the 17th century, in the beginning of the 18th century in Europe, we see a growth in population. This is due to a few factors. One of them being a decrease in epidemic diseases going around, the introduction of new food crops, and an all in all better living conditions for everyone. But a growth in people also means more mouths to feed. This is when the enlightened rulers started stepping in and promoting the potato as food for the people. One of these enlightened rulers is one of my favorite historical figures ever, Frederick the Great or Frederick II of Prussia. Oh Prussia, if only we had known each other a little bit better. Frederick saw the potential in the nutritional value of this potato. Well, not this potato specifically. I saw the benefit of the nutritional value of this specific potato. He was one of the rulers who wants to incentivize its farmers to grow potatoes instead of more traditional crops. One of the ways in which he did this was by using the Kartoffelbefehl. I'm sorry if I slaughtered that to my German viewer. In the Kartoffelbefehl, Kartoffelbefehl. he basically told farmers to get acquainted with the potato, start growing it and get used to it because of its sheer nutritional value. A small plot of potatoes could feed more people than a whole field of grain could. Say that a one by one square field of grain can feed one person. That same one by one square, if you grow potatoes on it, can feed four persons. But my boy Frederick also did some sneaky tactics in order for people to get used to these beauties of potatoes. One of the things he did, for example, was tell guards to go and guard potato fields to make it look like there was a lot of value in it. Because if something has value, people want to have it. And by doing that, people actually started growing it and started reporting that the potatoes tasted better. Because if it was good enough for the king, it should taste good. That's some big brain moves right there. Frederick II's reign is so entwined with the potato that he is known as the Kartoffelkoning. Kartoffelbefehl. Uh, nowadays, if you go to his grave in Sans Souci, uh, you will find potatoes laying on his grave. And I can tell you this from personal experience. Go there. Those potatoes are there. Bring a potato and leave it there for him. He deserves it. Now that we're done with the tangent about Frederick the Great, let's go back to more general history. In 1770, Europe experienced what is called the Little Ice Age. And in order to fully explain what's happening there, I would have to go into a whole different video about it, which I plan on doing because the Little Ice Age is fascinating and it did a whole cultural revolution and I love myself some cultural revolution. But we're not going to do that in this video. Due to the difference in temperature, crops that they were more used to didn't grow so well. So people had to switch over. Grain started to die, but the hardy potato could grow perfectly well. Combine that with the incentivizing of the enlightened rulers and that led to potato production taking off all over Europe and it turning slowly from a newcomer to the staple food of Europe and kicking grain right off. People started seeing the benefits of these. They were high in calories, they didn't require as much space to grow, they didn't spoil very fast and they were cheap. This is cheap food people! In 1845, one third of Ireland that could be farmed was farming potatoes. One third. That's 33% of the country farming for potatoes. It became the go-to food for the Industrial Revolution. Fueling workers who were working in the factories. Even so that Friedrich Engels, yes, that Friedrich Engels, said that the role of the potato was just as revolutionary as that of iron. You hear that little potato? According to Friedrich Engels, you're just as revolutionary as iron. I'm so proud of you. However, there was very little diversity in the potato crop across Europe. This made it susceptible to blights. People also started relying a lot on these. Whole societies, cities, civilizations, nations counted on these potatoes. Combine that with the susceptibility to blights, you have a recipe for disaster. But luckily that never did happen. Oh no, wait, it did. Herb one, which is also something that you could find in the secret recipe of KFC, uh, is the name of a potato blight that hit Europe around the 1840s, 1850s. And it was raging through Europe all during the 19th century. 
and one of the countries that had most to suffer was... You guessed it! The conditions in Ireland had led to potatoes being not just a staple food, but being the only food together with dairy that poor families could rely on. With the potatoes dying to the blight of Herb 1, the families went hungry, and that's how the Irish famine started. Because a monocrop system is a terrible idea and you should never do it. Nowadays we can barely picture a world without potatoes. It would be a world without french fries, without mashed potatoes, without baked potatoes, without hash browns. If you look beyond those things, we would be living in a vastly different world. We would have to work a lot harder to get the same amount of resources. The world would probably be less industrialized and as a result of that, I probably couldn't even make this video. You couldn't probably sit behind your screen and cars wouldn't be what they are today. All in all, we have to thank the potato for a lot. So next time you eat a potato, take a moment and think about what it has done for you, the people you love and the family and world around you and say, thank you little potato. To finish this off, we have a lot to thank. So to finish this off, we have a lot to thank these two brilliant tubers for. And to be honest, if you enjoyed this video, please leave it a like and subscribe for more quality content. I intend to release a video every single week. Um, please leave in the comment down below what you would want me to cover next. Also, follow me on Instagram, expect Jade. Follow me on Twitter, expect Jade. I hit 20 subscribers in 2020. Now, let's go for 100 in 2021. Please. And with that being said, I only have one thing left to say to you all. Bye-bye.